And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have built, I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept all my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and they are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and blow down before your feet, and they will learn that you, I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial, the trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I, I am coming so, soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. And, no, and one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven, and my own name, new name. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'm standing in the modern city of al Shahir, the site of the ancient city, Philadelphia. This city was formed by the Greek Empire about 150 years before the time of Jesus by a king named Attalus II. Attalus founded the city and named it Philadelphia to honor his older brother as an indication of his deep love for him. As we know from the city with the same name in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia means brotherly love. This city was important in its location. It was founded by the Greeks as a gateway to the east. It sits along the King's Road, a major trading route, and it was founded to spread the culture of Greece. It was, in essence, a missionary outpost for the Hellenization of the region. In fact, it was sometimes called Little Athens because it represented the ideal of Greek life in a faraway place on the way to the mysterious east. Eventually, Greece as an empire was overshadowed by Rome, and this city became an outpost of Roman culture as well. The city itself was very loyal to Rome by the time of the first century, and worship of the emperor was alive and well here, as it is throughout the entire empire. The phrase Caesar is Lord was as common and as patriotic as the anthem, God bless America might be today. In the midst of this prestige, however, there lurked an ever-present danger. This is a rich region agriculturally. During the first century AD when this letter was written, it was known for its vineyards that rivaled even the vineyards of Rome. And this is still true today. All around me and in this countryside are fertile fields of grapes and a variety of crops. And because of this emphasis on wine and growth and crops, the most prevalent Greek god who was worshipped in this whole area was Dionysus. He is the god of the grape harvest and wine drinking and fertility. And so you would rightly assume that the worship of this god was accompanied by lots of drunkenness and sexual promiscuity. So wine drinking and grape harvesting were a massive part of the industry in this area. And the reason that grapes and vineyards were so successful here in this area was the fact that this city, along with much of the region, has volcanic, mineral-rich soil. But this is where the danger emerges. Like many volcanic regions, the soil here is rich, but there is an ever-present danger of earthquakes from shifting tectonic plates and movement in the Earth's crust. In fact, in 17 AD, a massive earthquake struck this city, completely destroying it. And the earthquake was so intense that the aftershocks lasted for 20 years. The devastation that this brought was significant. So significant, in fact, that the Roman emperor at the time freed them from paying any taxes for years in order to stimulate their economy and help them rebuild. Because of these aftershocks, there were many times where progress was made and then reversed, and the people grew accustomed to living with the constant threat of an earthquake and uncertainty. Imagine living in a place where a natural disaster could strike at any time that could level your city, and you had no technology to predict or prevent it. They were very familiar with uncertainty. They also had developed a deep loyalty to Caesar because of his investment in their rebuilding efforts. His commitment to their success was obviously viewed very positively by the people of the city. 
So the people of Philadelphia had both a strong loyalty to Rome and a healthy, constant fear of disaster, striking in the forms of buildings collapsing, setbacks in growth, and economic failure. As we've mentioned throughout the series, during the Roman Empire, worship of the emperor, or Caesar, was common. And this sounds kind of strange to our modern American minds because of the amount of intellectual and religious freedom that we experience in our country. But for most of the cultures that Rome came to control, this requirement to worship the emperor wasn't a struggle. They were already polytheistic, meaning they already believed in many gods, like the Greeks and others. So Rome's insistence that they worship Caesar and be loyal to him as a god, it really didn't bother them. They simply saw it as an inevitable result of being under the control of a brand new regime. Jewish people, however, were a problem. They were thoroughly and staunchly monotheistic, meaning they were insistent on worshiping just one God. Now, Rome was willing to tolerate this to an extent. On average, the Jews were well-treated under the Roman rule. In fact, they were granted an exemption from the required emperor worship so long as they were obedient citizens. Thus, synagogues, like the one that I'm standing in right now, which were essentially the cultural center of social and religious life for Jews, they kept records of their members. These roles and logs allowed them to specify to the Roman administration who was legally allowed to ignore the command to declare that Caesar is Lord. Philadelphia, a city known for its rich vineyards, strong connection to Rome, and the worship of a fertility god, standing on a main trade route as a shining beacon of Roman culture to the world beyond. That's the city to which Jesus writes this letter. These Christians were in a city that believed that Caesar is Lord, but they were uncertain what next earthquake might bring the city to its knees. The city of Philadelphia, this was the enduring church. Well, good morning again, Grace Church. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Brad, and I am excited that you're with us this morning. We have been walking through this Series 7, looking at letters that were written to ancient churches in the early first century world. These were legit cities, and these letters were sent, and we think when we get a letter, right, like if, if Pat, since you, you, you knew what seven was, I'm going to pick on you. If you sent me a letter, right, and I got it out of my mailbox, I wouldn't expect my neighbor to read it, right? right? I wouldn't expect uh, my neighbor to read it and then pass it to my next neighbor, my next neighbor. My, we, that would be weird for us, right? But that, that's exactly what these letters were intended to do. These were letters written that were intended to be read by everyone else. So though it was written to, let's say, the church at Philadelphia, what we're going to look at today, all the other churches on this mail route were supposed to read it and learn from it. And so we are continuing that tradition as we look at the beginning of the book of Revelation. As we've said several times that this is a this is a unique book. It's unique in that, it, as we see here at the beginning in, in chapter one, that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the revealing, the uncovering, the, the giving away of knowledge otherwise unknown from the very Son of God who was God, who was also fully man. This beautiful, amazing, mind-blowing truth that this person is revealing to us what we, what we need to know, what is otherwise hidden. And that is, that is an amazing, amazing concept right there. And then we learned that when we're talking about revelation, it's, that means that it's also a genre that we might not otherwise be familiar with. We talked about for several weeks now that it's not going to be like reading a, you know, standard fiction novel or a standard uh, history, knowledge, uh, history novel or a book of poetry or really anything that we have that it is wholly different. And we have to be prepared for some pretty interesting pieces from all those different genres kind of mixing in with the idea that it is very symbolic and that we have to kind of dig in to get some of the meaning behind some of the words and the images that are used. So as we start here in chapter one, like we've done for each week, we read that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So Jesus is giving this and he's giving it for the church, but he's doing it through John. So he shares this with John. We jump down to verse 17. When I, and speaking of John here, saw him, saw Jesus, it says, I fell at his feet as though dead. Can you imagine that? I mean, just think about that. When in your life have you walked into the presence of a person and it was just so profound that you fell down like you were dead? Now, if you're a husband, you say, the day I saw my wife walking down the aisle. That's the right answer there, okay? Just so you know, 
okay? And you, you, your pastor's giving you sanction to lie if you need to because you'll score a lot of points, okay? No. But this is such an amazing, amazing encounter. He fell down as though dead. Then he says, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Look at this last phrase. I have the keys of death and Hades. See, this one who was revealing is the Lord, the master, the sovereign over all of life, even over death. The death cannot reign over him, but that he has authority. And as we'll see, this idea of key is a symbol, is a picture of authority and mastery over. That's what keys, especially in the, the ancient world, symbolized. Because now, when you left your house today, did you or did you not lock your door? How, how many of you locked your door? How many of you didn't? Okay, I'm, I'm noting this, and I, I know which houses to go to when you're out of, no. But do all of our houses have locks? Well, most of them do, okay? Whoever said no, you're just being ornery. Okay, our houses have locks. Our cars have locks. We, and, and we lock things because we're saying, this is mine, right? And you may not have it. This is not just yours to take. In the ancient world, not everything had keys. Only the most important things did. And they didn't have the same level of sophistication when it came to locks. So if they had a key, then they did have some smaller ones, but the bigger something was, the bigger the key needed to be. And so they have, they have records of uh, historical finds of ancient keys that were so huge, they literally had to be carried on the shoulder like you were carrying a large weight. So we're going to see that picture come back. But if someone was walking around carrying a giant key on their shoulder, what did that tell the world around them? Well, whoever's got the key, that person is important. That person has authority over something big. And it was a symbol to the world. Not just that you, that you had it, and, and so that, that symbolized you in authority, but people could see you. It wasn't something you would just like, kind of like slide into your pocket and go on your day. If you had a key to, for instance, the city gates, that meant you were carrying a large item around with you. And now, that's, that's how Jesus introduces in the beginning of Revelation. And like we said, we've been walking through this mail route, starting with the Apostle John and Patmos. He's been exiled he's, for his faith, and he's writing now what he received from Jesus, this experience that we just read about in chapter 1. And we started by going to Ephesus with the church that had lost its first love. We then went to Smyrna, and in Smyrna, we, this was a good church. These were people who were doing the right things but they were still facing trouble. And we wrestled with that idea that why do we still suffer when we do it the right way? And I would encourage you, if you still got questions there, I'd love to chat with you because that's a tough one, but go back and listen to that message because I think we, we, we wrestled with some of those things um, to some degree of depth. But then we went to Pergamum. And again, this is where it starts where I don't know what to call the people, the Pergamumians I, I'm going with. The Pergamumians were, they were flirting with heresy or flirting with compromise. They were, they were doing some good stuff, but they were letting in some of the value structure of the world around them that was at odds with what, how Jesus lived. And then the next week we went to Thyatira. And in Thyatira, well, here were people that had just gone well beyond flirting and they were now married to compromise. They were in bed with compromise. They had just tried to take all the stuff of the world, all the stuff of the church and just kind of smush it together and say, oh, yeah, sure, we can do it all. We learned that that was just not compatible. You, you can't squish those things together. There are exclusive claims that you can't try to hold in tandem. And then we went to uh, Sardis. That was last week. And we talked about them as the sleepy church. And so much so that they were, they were so asleep that, that Jesus basically called them dead. You're a dead church that you look alive, but you're actually dead, that you're showing up, like in our context, you're showing up on Sundays, but you're dead. The lights are on, but you're dead because you're not doing the things you did at first. You've tried to just kind of coast on your laurels, as it were. And from there now, we're traveling to Philadelphia. And the interesting thing here is of these seven churches, one that we haven't gotten to yet, 
But, you know, we're on number six. The five we've gone through before, there's seven of them. Two of them are only commended. They're, they're given the thumbs up. Hey, you did a good job. And the others are, it's either a mix of good and bad or, hey, like last week, you're just kind of pretty terrible at Sardis, okay? But this week, Philadelphia is the church that got nothing bad said about them. Philadelphia is the kind of church where you, this is what you would want Jesus to say to you. And why I think this is important, because what we need to do is, as we're looking at these letters written to all these churches in the uh, ancient world, we need to remember that it's kind of a diagnostic tool for us, right? Like, right now on my dashboard in my car, there's a little light that's on. And I, I've had it checked out, and it's, it's a faulty sensor. But when that light first came on, do you know what happened? <sighs> oh, no something's broken and it's going to cost me money, <laughs> right? When we have that, those lights and those dashboards come on, that's to get our attention and say, something needs to happen. You need to check this out. It's a, it pushes us to run a diagnostic. And that's what these letters are doing for us. They're kind of diagnostic tools saying, there's like a flashing engine light, like, hey, check, see if this is going on. And that's what we need to do. So we're going to do that now as we look at the church at Philadelphia. And we know this is not, you know, Philadelphia down the road. You know, this is other side of the world kind of Philadelphia. But it was very interesting how they got their name. And it says here in uh, chapter 3, verse 7, it says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia. All right? And we're, we're just going to, we're going to zero in there for a little bit. This idea of Philadelphia. Because the interesting thing is, uh, in this letter... Jesus doesn't play into that word too much. He just kind of introduces them there. But in the, the rest of the Bible, we're told to kind of do this thing that the word Philadelphia means. What does Philadelphia mean? City of brotherly love. And in the, the actual Greek, it is phileadelphos, which is to love or brotherly love and city. So we, they actually reverse it in the, in the Greek language, but it's the city of brotherly love. It's the city where love of brother is to be manifest. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to be a city, as it were, a community that is known by our love for one another, known by our love for others. So what does that mean? Well, part of it is answering this question, what is brotherly love? It's, it's love for your brother. It's like family love. It's about being who you call most important, and you demonstrate that by what you do. So, how many of you have a sibling? Anybody? A couple of you. And your siblings were always super nice to you, right? Right, Haley? Always. Colton's so awesome. Come on. But you're always nice to him, right? <laughs> I love the honesty. No. No. We know in this world, siblings tend to do what? Fight, Right? Um, you, you know, if, if you know me at all, I've got three boys. They, I think they have made an Olympic sport out of picking on one another, okay? But do you know what happens if somebody else tries to pick on one of them? Oh, it is throwdown time, okay? I remember that in high school. My brother was horrible to me. I love my brother, but he was horrible to me. We got to be much better friends later on. But even though he was horrible to me, especially when I was like in middle school and he was in high school and I was that annoying middle school kid that, you know, the high school kid didn't want anything to do with, so he'd make fun of me. But do you know what happened if anybody picked on me? He let loose on him. I remember that. I remember one scene clear as day when I was in high school as a freshman. It was like I was elevated upon the shoulders of the upperclassmen because my brother came to bat for me. And that's what brothers do. That's what sisters do. That's what siblings do because we say that is my family family hands off and we'll fight for them and when it comes down to it, even though we pick on one another we're for one another but part of the problem with that is sometimes when we're so close we can begin to take take some of that for granted and we can forget how we're supposed to love and we can let little things slide in that start to chip away now, if you're on our email list, I sent out um, just this past Friday uh, a link to an article, which was interesting as I was, I was reading it. It was basically how to prevent brotherly love, how, how to stop brotherly love from happening. 
So I'm going to tap into that a little bit, but I'm not going to anywhere near exhaust it. So if, if you haven't already read that, I encourage you to read it because it would really put a perspective because we'll often talk about, hey, here's some of the loving things you can do. I think it's also important for us to recognize there are some things we can do that get in the way of authentically loving others. So we're going to look at just a few of those. This is not, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch. But what is brotherly love? I'd say it's community. You can't do this thing called brotherly love in isolation. So what is it not? It's not isolation. You can't do brotherly love if you're by yourself, which is one of the things like we're so glad that we have the opportunity to do virtual things and, and, and have live streams. And um, even right now, we've got some people who couldn't come this morning because someone was sick. So they're able to be at home and still stay connected. So excited for that. But you can't brotherly love someone kind of remotely. I mean, there's some pieces you can do to that, but the real authentic, authentic brotherly love, you have to be together. Hebrews 10 tells us this. It says, do not neglect the habit of, or, or, or do not neglect gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. Don't do it. Even back at the beginning of the church, people were like, oh yeah, Jesus, he's awesome. But man, you know, I just need, I need to chill out and rest a little bit. You know, I've had a hard week of gathering, right? It's tough, but, they, but even at that point, they were told it's imperative that you gather together. You can't do brotherly love when you're by yourself. Well, what else is it? In similar, you, in your, when you're in the community, it is presence. What do we mean by that? Well, kind of look at what it's not. It's not disengagement because you can be somewhere and not be there. You know what I'm talking about? You know, where you're literally having a conversation with a person, you, you, you can tell they're somewhere else right now, okay? You know how I know that happens? Because I do this every Sunday, and I can see some of y'all are somewhere else, okay? It happens. Okay, squirrel. Yes, squirrel. <laughs> but the, the point of this is, it's, to, it's that there is... There's a need to be there, not just physically present, but with your whole person. We read in Romans 10 that we're to outdo one another in showing honor. You can't show honor to somebody if you're just disengaged from what they're, from what they're doing, what they're saying, who they are. So it requires that. But it also, it means that it's interested. In a similar way, it, that, and it's not superficial then. Meaning, if you're talking to me, what you have to say matters. That's a tough one because in the world we live, we kind of, well, you're interested in what's interesting to you. But if we understand how God's made us, we did a whole series a little while back called the Imago Dei, which is the Latin words for the image of God. And what we discussed there is that every single human being in all of creation is invested with the very image of God, that we reflect the value, the worth of the almighty creator simply by our existence and therefore each and every one of us has inestimable value. That our worth is beyond anything that could ever be bought, right? And if, if you are that valuable, you deserve me being interested in you, okay? That's how we have to be with people. We can't be just superficial like, Oh, so yeah, nice weather we're having today. All right, see you later, and be on our way. And so many of our, of our interactions are like that. You know, it's, it's even some of the, 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 the world of, of social media as well. It's like, well, I gave them a thumbs up, right? I said congrats, you know? And we think that that's kind of this engaged interest, and it's not. It's where we stop and we see people for who they are and we dig in. If you read in 1 Corinthians 12, we read these words, God arranged the members of the body of his church, each one of them as he chose. You are specifically chosen to be who you are. And if God values you and God chose you to be what you are, then the rest of us who are equally chosen need to be interested and not superficial with you. That's brotherly love. It's not shallow. But it is reconciling. You catch that? Um, 
when we read in uh, Galatians 3, a letter from the Apostle Paul, he writes these words, that those who are part of God's family, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Jesus, this perfect God-man who never sinned, never sinned, something that none of us could say, he still died for sin, but he died for our sin. And so since he didn't sin and he paid the debt for what sin owed, he now has this credit of righteousness that he offers to us. And those of us who have accepted that, who have accepted God forgiving us on the basis of what Jesus did, when we have that, we're one. We are equalized as part of his family and that we are to be in unity. Unity is one of the things that is stressed more than anything else in scripture. It's not the most, it is one of the most stressed things that's supposed to be about God's family, that we are unified in Jesus, that we have that central pull. That's why we say, why do we exist? We exist to help people live Jesus-centered lives because as if we all live a life that is centered around the person, the work, the teaching of Jesus, we will be able to all experience the help, the hope, and the healing of Jesus and be able to share it with others. That's what it's about. It's about calling people into it. You've heard me say time and time again, and others say time and time again, that at our church, we believe that rescued people do something. What do they do? They rescue people. They reconcile. They bring back in. So it means that brotherly love is not unresolved conflict. Here's the thing. If we want to be a church that honors Jesus, if we want to be a church that moves ahead into the the glorious future that I believe Jesus has for us, we are not going to be a church that holds on to bitterness, to, well, why didn't they? Or can you believe that they did this? But it will be, I want to talk to this person and set things right because, quite frankly, Jesus has forgiven me for way more than anything any person has ever done to, to me. So I'm going to set this right. I am going to fix what is broken in relationships. That's what we need to be in a church. So it's not about unresolved conflict. It's about reconciling, bringing back together. And in kind of similar fashion, again, these lists aren't exhaustive. It is kind and true. Do you know what it's not? Well, here's one word, but there's several that kind of go with it. It's not gossip. It's not talking about people behind their backs. It's not about complaining. It's not about grumbling. It's not about having a critical spirit. It is about kindness and truth. Ephesians 4.15 describes the church that we are to be speaking the truth in love. And in so doing, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. If we're living a Jesus-centered life, we will not grumble or complain. You've heard me say this, a similar phrase before, but a grumbling, complaining, gossiping spirit or approach is incompatible with what Jesus says it means to follow him. So if we're doing that, we need to do a heart check. Last week, we used that phrase from 2 Corinthians where where we are told to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. Because just being here, although I'm so super glad that you were here, that doesn't make you a Jesus follower because you showed up in this room. Do you know what makes you a a, a follower of Jesus? It's a pretty complex answer. Harold got it. You follow Jesus, which means you don't just go, well, that's not what I want. That's not what I think. You go, oh, that's what Jesus said. Jesus is right. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. So if he says to do it, I'm going to do it. So I'm going to follow after. I'm going to do the things that he does, do the things that he did, follow the things that he has said, So even if that's in in conflict with what my natural response would be or what I like the most, I go, that's okay, Jesus said it. I can do it. So this is just a a snapshot because we could spend multiple weeks really fleshing out this idea of brotherly love. But that's what we're called to, and that's what this city was. But let's look here. Let's move kind of quickly through this letter that was actually written to this church. As we keep reading, it says, uh, write these words. The words of the Holy One, the true one. This is a designation that the people of Philadelphia, the Christians that that Jesus was writing to, where there was this kind of strong Jewish presence, they would recognize because uh, these were words used of God in the Old Testament. Often he was called holy and true. But then look here, this goes back to what we read at the beginning of our time together, who has the key of David, who opens, and no one will shut who shuts. 
and no one opens. <coughs> Remember the key was a symbol of authority. And what is this the key of? This is the key of David. And if you know anything about the kind of the Old Testament and what was going on there, there was promises made to this line, this family line, the line of David, that, they would, that he would produce a savior who would save the world. And that this was a promise made and that the, 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 the promised heir would have dominion over all things. And so if you have the key of David, you're claiming, I have dominion and authority over this, that I am the fulfillment of that promise. And we know it's a direct promise because if we would look, we don't, you don't have to flip there, but you can maybe mark a note, Isaiah 22 and verse 22. There's a situation where there was a guy who was a steward over the Lord's house and he was being kind of a, a, a butt, okay? He was just being a jerk. And there's a prophecy saying, I'm gonna take this away from you and give it to, that guy's name was Shebna. So if you're looking for a name for a kid, I think that's a good one, Shebna. You can call him Shebby, right? Well, uh, he, that was not going to go well for him. The Lord was going to take it away and give it to Eliakim, his servant. And how does it say that he was going to do it? Well, in Isaiah 22, 22, it says, And I will place on his shoulder, this is Eliakim, the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Does that sound familiar? I hope so, because we just read it. This is pretty much a direct quote in Revelation of Isaiah, tying that in that Jesus, he's saying, this is who I am. I am the one who has this key. I am this one who has this authority. So after he's done introducing himself, Jesus goes on in verse eight and says, I know your works. If you've been tracking with us, most weeks here, we, we kind of zero in on words like the, just like this or similar to this, where we're known to Jesus. Jesus knows what's going on, what we're doing, and what's in our hearts. But what specifically is Jesus saying that he knows? Well, let's keep reading. He says, behold, I have set before you an open door. We're going to come back to this in just a few moments. But there's two major views about what this door is. And the idea is that it's either a door saying, hey, I've, I've offered you salvation. You know, that you could enter into eternity with me. But in another way, there's others who say, well, this is kind of written to, to those who are already who've already walked through that. So maybe what he's saying here is it's a door of opportunity, a door to step out into something, something grand, something glorious for him that, that Jesus had intended for this church at Philadelphia. And he says then that this door, no one is able to shut. But look what comes next. This is, this is just this was humbling for me and powerful for me this week because I think this is one of the things that probably Jesus would say to us, us as a church family here in effort. He says, I know that you have but little power. Wait a minute. How is that encouraging? Jesus just said, you're a wuss, right? You're not very strong. Well, guess what? Jesus has a habit. God has a habit, not just a accidental habit, but an intentional habit of using the weak and weak things in this world to accomplish mighty, powerful, great things. How do I know that? Because there's this guy named Moses. who was a stuttering, murdering coward. God used him to free his people. It's a guy named Gideon who was a wuss. He, he hid from his enemies in the wine press. And when God miraculously showed up and said, I'm going to use you, he's like, yeah, but can you really prove it? He doubted God and he was a coward. Then there's David. David was an adulteress, at least. There's a lot of evidence that he was actually probably a rapist, that he was a rapist and a murderer. And God used him not only to be king and do good things, but to bring about his very heir who would be savior of the world. Go back before that, there's this person named Rahab who was a prostitute who was used to save God's people, even though in her culture, she would have been at the bottom, the absolute bottom of the social ladder. Then there's Peter, right? One of the leaders of Jesus' own disciples, the inner circle, right? Seen the miracles, taught beside him, did the miracles, right? Amazing stuff. And when Jesus needed him most, Peter d denied him with curses, explicit language that he had ever even met the dude. And yet God used him. And then there's Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote uh, most of the books of what we call our New Testament of our Bible. 
who was trying to enact genocide on the Christians in the first century. How do I know that Jesus uses the weak? How do I know that God uses the weak to accomplish great things? Because he's done it from the beginning of humanity. It doesn't matter how weak we are. God can use us to do mighty things because he is opening the door. And look how he responds, he said, or, or how the people respond. He said, you have little power, yet you have both kept my word and have not denied my name. These are, this is, this is a powerful bringing together of two thoughts. Because here's what's true, okay? I can do good without following Jesus. Were you aware of that? It's not only Christians who do good things. So if you thought like, you know, you're this paradigm of holy virtue and everyone who does not believe exactly like you is like the, the spawn of the devil, that's not how it works. You can do good and not follow Jesus, but that's going to end in tragedy ultimately. But you can also profess faith without possessing it. And for me, that's scarier. Because if you can call on Jesus, you can have this false sense that, oh yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian, I, I, I do that Jesus thing. But if you don't actually possess that faith, if you don't actually have that relationship, that connection, that withness with Jesus, you're in the same place as someone doing good without following Jesus. At the end of it, what we're talking about is being a disciple, someone who follows Jesus and leads others to follow him as well. And there's way more that goes into that. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus who does what he says? But those are the things that are brought together. That he said, you've kept my word, you've done it. You have not denied my name. That's what they were commended for. Now look what he says to them. And we're going to move pretty quickly through this last part. He says, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. Wow. Talk about name calling. You know, we tell our kids not to call other people names, but I'm pretty sure Jesus gets a pass. He's the one who's allowed to call names because he knows everything, right? That's a pretty, pretty intense name to be called. That'd be like calling us the church of Satan. Would, would that go over well? Think and not, okay? So this is strong language. And the thing is, at this time, like they were saying, the, the, the Jews kind of held the key for uh, the Christians in this, in this city in particular, meaning that they were given this special dispensation from the emperor that they didn't have to say Jesus was Lord, but only those who were officially part of the synagogue. And what we have is kind of the records here that they were being locked out of the synagogue because the Christians here, uh, from what we can tell, the, they were Jews who said, oh my goodness, who's this Jesus? Oh, I want to follow Jesus. It's not by keeping the law. It's Jesus has fulfilled the law. Now I follow him and do good, but I don't do good to get in. I'm in, so I do good. And it's different from this Jewish system. So the leaders of the Jewish synagogue said, well, you're doing something other than what we want, so you're out. You're not on the rolls anymore. And do you know what that did? Put a crosshair on the Christians. They could be persecuted. They could be ostracized. They could even be killed because they wouldn't say Caesar is Lord. And if they were locked out of the synagogue, then they weren't allowed to be on the roll. And that's what was happening. So this synagogue of Satan were those who were claiming to be God's family, but they weren't living like it. And that's, that, that's, a, that's a dangerous thing. Because again, we can profess faith in Jesus without possessing it. Just because we say we're a church, just because we say we're Christians, doesn't mean we're living like it, and it's vitally important that we do. He goes on and says, these people say they're Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. They will learn that I have loved you. They're, Jesus is saying, hey, man, they are, they are throwing this terrible stuff on you, but don't worry. One day they will see. And then he keeps going. He explains. He says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. That's another one of those that we love, right? We, we all love, you know, patiently enduring. You know, if I, hey, I'm not doing anything this week and I was thinking about doing some patient endurance, right? That, we don't like that. But on one level, we're called to it because we recognize we live in a broken world. He says, because of that, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to those who dwell on the earth. And there are different ways of looking at what, the, what we call in kind of religious circles eschatology. Do we know what eschatology means? It's one of those fancy theology words. It's actually kind of two words, the eschaton and logos. It's the study of the last things. So it's looking at end times. There's lots of different ways of looking at it. 
And there is, uh, it's one of, in my opinion, one of the, the hardest ones to engage in graciously, because if you look at people who go, well, I'm in this camp, and I'm in this camp, and I'm in this camp, and they all have evidence. And do you know what the evidence is? It's pretty much the same verses. They just say, oh, wait, but it means this. So I do believe there is a, uh, a best way of looking at this. And, and, and our tribe of churches would say that what, and some of this would lean into it, that at the end of all things, God is going to come and set things right. And we're not going to be here for that, those who have chosen to follow, follow Jesus. That there's going to be a sparing of the judgment that is to come. But this is, again, one of those places where we need to have grace as we interact with others, because I have seen churches split. I have seen relationships break over people thinking about, well, is it going to be at this time or that time? And what are all the intricacies? That's not what it's about. It's about Jesus is going to come back and set things right. That's what we believe as a church. And we can get more into the details of it, because I do have opinions. Shocker. And I have strong opinions. Again, I'm sure most of you that know me are very, very surprised by that notion. But I do think we need to have some grace with it. But I believe this is, this is what Jesus is promising. Hey, as you patiently endure and you follow after me, if you're faithfully one of mine, you will not have to endure what judgment is coming. And we'll just kind of read here at the end. He says, I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. It's that endurance. And then he rounds it out with this, verses 12 and 13. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. I could show you pictures today of the present day city of uh, Philadelphia. And because of the earthquakes and all the things that have gone on, most of the structures of that day are gone. Most of what remains, like as you come into the city, are these giant pillars, huge stone structures that although they're cracked in this, that they still stand. And that was in the, the architecture of the day. These would be the things that would withstand these earthquakes that they, they struck all the time. What Jesus is promising is you will be part of my eternal home, of my eternal worship. You'll be with me forever. He's promising to grant them a permanent foundational place throughout all eternity. It says in the temple of my God, never shall he go out of it and I will write on him. Neat architectural name. Like if you go to those pillars, they're inscribed. They're inscribed with names of people who did prominent things in the, the, the city itself, in the construction of the city, or who had done things of great renown to, that were, they just needed to be remembered. And what does he inscribe on him? He says, write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the, of, the, of the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Now, what does that all mean? Here's what I believe the big picture is. That, that when he's talking about writing these names, it's those who trust in and follow Jesus will forever be part of God's family. They will be living in his home with intimate, tangible access to the author of creation through our, our intimate, tangible association with Jesus. It's a mouthful to say we're going to be forever with God in God's home. That's what's being promised. It's not this floating on the clouds thing that we sometimes think of. And it's not this, you go away to it. Because where, where does the city of, uh, of God come from? What do these verses tell us? It says, comes down from my God out of heaven. That there is a recreation of the earth and, and the created universe. We are not going to be some disembodied spirits floating throughout space at the end of all things, that we will have life and with others that we love, with that to express that brotherly love throughout all time with others that are part of God's family. That's the joy of it. It's not this ethereal existence. It's a very physical existence where spirit and flesh are brought back together at the end of all things. Now, I don't know what it all means, but I know it's going to be good. So here's my question for you. I said we were going to come back to it. I want to ask you, what are we doing with, with my door? What are, we, what are you doing with the door that, that Jesus has opened for you? Well, for us as a church, we're doing things where we're pushing into hot chocolate stands just to bless our community. We're doing a game night to invite people in so that they just have relationships and connection and a break from the busyness of it all. We're partnering more with CityGate and coming up with new opportunities to be a blessing in our community. We're trying to take advantage of the door that Jesus has opened for our church. And it can be scary because quite frankly, look at the world around us. Inflation, war, deception, lies, 
there's so much junk going on in the world. It can be very tempting to just circle our wagons, buckle down and say, let's try to ride it out. But Jesus isn't saying lock down. He's opening a door and asking us to go. So what I'd like you to do is, if you wouldn't mind, humor me for a moment. I'm gonna ask everybody to kind of close their eyes, bow their heads, kind of block out some of the distractions of what's going on. Because I'd like for not just us as a church family, but for each of us as individuals who make up the church, who are here today, to look at the door from the two possibilities of what it might mean. First of all, have you ever walked through the door of salvation? Have you come to that place of understanding who Jesus is, what he's done, and chosen to accept his forgiveness and follow after him? If you have not done that, today's the day to do it. Today's the the time for you to, to embrace that, to embrace the hope, the help, and the healing that comes from Jesus. If, if you're in that place, I invite you to pray this prayer along with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that you provided the way for me to be forgiven and to be forever with you. Come in, make me clean and help me to follow after you. In Jesus' name. Now, if you've prayed that prayer, just eyes bowed still, if you wouldn't mind. Heads bowed. Talk to me before you leave. So I want to help invite you along on the journey of what's to come on the other side of that decision. But for those of you who have already made that decision, I want you to ask the Lord, what's the door of opportunity that he's opening for you right now? We're going to be quiet for just a few moments. I'm asking you to, between you and the Lord, what is that door of opportunity? Because our impact is determined by our obedience. So what door is he opening and what do you need to do to obey and walk through? Please, right now in the quietness of your heart, ask Jesus what that door is. And now I ask you to ask Jesus what it means, what it would take for you to walk through it. Father, thank you that though we may have little strength, you use weak things to do great deeds. Father, we thank you that you have opened the door to us, the door to forever with you and your family, and the door to those great things, the door of opportunity here and now. And Lord, for anyone who's made that decision to follow you today, Pray that you give them the strength to to talk to me or someone up on the stage today to know what to do next. And for the rest of us, God, I pray that you don't let the exercise of looking at the door of opportunity be just that, but give us the courage, the strength, the, the conviction to walk through it. Give us the wisdom to know and the courage to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have the keys, that you have the keys of death, and Hades, but you have the keys of life and light and heaven. And thank you for inviting us in. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.